or welcome to Tech Talk Weekly. I'm Bob from Creation Station. This is our weekly show where we talk about two to three cool stories in the news, give you a fun library tidbit and send you on your way in 15 to 20 minutes each week. Today, I have Bill Fritz, the branch manager over at Imperial Point with us today. How are you doing today, sir, Bill? I'm doing great. How are you doing today, Bob? Doing really well. How's, how goes life out there? Um, very good. We're uh, getting progressively busier. Um, we're seeing more and more, especially kids coming in, which is really nice. And our um, uh, summer learning program is going very well. So things are fine. Great. Good, 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 good. Are you guys at break spot this year again? No, we're not. Okay. I remember was it was two summers ago or whatever, I was out there for a break spot thing going on. Um, so I'm going to just share off because there were some really fun um, stories out there this week. It seems like everything came about at the end. Um, all the planetary news came out this week. I'm not sure if it's just the algorithms feeding me all sorts of uh, space news or whatever. Um, the first story that we have is there's two new planets found, which nowadays is not really that big of a deal. Uh, but one of the interesting things I found out I liked about this story was when I was reading into it and finding that it was all citizen scientists who discovered these two planets. Have you done any of the um, citizen sciences, scientist type stuff yet, Bill? No, but what was really interesting about this particular article was it reminded me of whenever I was uh, in college in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, I went to the uh, West Virginia University, the Jesuit College, and they mm -hmm. had a uh, NASA simulator, uh, the shuttle simulator set up there. Cool. And the class, the class that went there that day, we were the, the shuttle crew, and we all took on different jobs within the shuttle, and the culmination of the day's event was to discover a planet. So it was really an interesting uh, day. With the that is awesome. I love that. I wonder if they still do that up there. That is really cool. I like that whole idea there. Um, yeah, this is using um, the data that NASA gets down or the various telescopes that they get out there. Um, they bring it out to uh, a place, it's uh, Planet Hunters. I'll show you the website here in just a second. And what they do is they put up all sorts of data for um, just everyday people to comb through and look because human eyes are still better than computer AI at figuring out that two things are close or not close and stuff like that. So I thought this was, it's really interesting that, you know, one of these kids, he's not a kid, he, he, he and his kids would just sit there and pour over the images and doing this kind of stuff. Um, and here is that Planet Hunters, the test project. Um, it's Zune, Zuneverse. Uh, they do several different things out there on Zuneverse, and this is Planet Hunters uh, for citizen science. And you get to go in and participate in that and you'll see they've only covered 39 percent of their data that they have right now so they can always use more people for all this kind of stuff and then in keeping with the yeah tell me bill one of the things i find very interesting in that article that i wouldn't have thought of was that they're actually looking at areas where there's um light that it, it shows like uh, is a diminishment of the light which is an indication that that could be a planet that's causing it. Yeah, and that's this right here too. Uh, so this this article just came out this morning or last night, um, and this was uh, figuring out how many, just like that project for us, some scientists kind of turned it on their head and say, okay, so who out there is looking at Earth at the sun the same way and having when you've got a planet that goes in front of it and and does something to reflect that and what would happen um it's a really yeah it's a really interesting technique and in just 29 years we are going to have someone there's going to be other planets out there that could potentially house life that will be able to do this to us. That's the next time what's going to happen um, as, as we get in and do this. And those are the ones that are in the Goldilocks zone, as they call it, and stuff like that. So it's a really, um, what do you think? Do you think there's aliens out there looking for us, Bill? 
Um, that's a very interesting question because I think it's really hard for us to say that we are only the only uh, intelligent life form in the universe. Definitely. Um, yeah. I think one thing that was interesting in the article, it said only 46 stars can see Earth. Yeah. Yeah. At this particular time. And as time progresses, that number is going to increase, which is only going to then uh, increase the possibility of contact from another life form. Yep. yep. And I think it's really interesting that um, part of it is how we're all expanding our knowledge of this idea. You know, the, the whole thing, uh, UFOs has been in the news lately with the Pentagon reports and things like that. And it's everybody just seems to be getting more on board that in the I remember growing up, if you were interested in this, you were really a hardcore geek and, you you know, you were out there on the <laughs> far edge. And now it's like just everybody just kind of accepts science fiction and accepts these things and does this. And the last of our trio of uh, stories that came out was um, an unfortunate one. Somebody else did some new math on it, and it looks like all these great, cool exoplanets that we've been finding in the Goldilocks zone might actually not work. Um, I think this one came up really uh, late in my day, so I don't think you had a chance to see this one, Bill. Um, no, I this is one of those things from TESS, um, that same citizen science thing we talked about, where they took and they took all the information of these stars, all these different planets that people are finding, and then they went and tracked how many of them are in the Goldilocks zone, where if you've got a rocky planet that's close enough to the sun so that it could have liquid water, et cetera, and stuff like that. But there's only been a couple okay. dozen of those so far. And now it's looking like they found 10 planets so far so in that zone, and none of them seem to be in the right space around the right star. So out of those several thousand stars that were out there, we were talking about the last article. Now we're down to 10 or maybe zero that have planets that might have people watching us. I don't know. Do you think it's better to have people watching us or to be alone? I think um, it's there's a very good chance that there is life out there. Um, the fact that uh, that we're here, just uh, the human race that we know, that we're the only ones in the whole galaxy that that exists, I think is um, is hard to imagine when you think of the vastness of the galaxy and just. Yeah, it's hard to even comprehend just how vast it is. I mean, you look at the fact that it takes uh, uh, radio waves that we've been sending out for years; they haven't even reached very far into the universe at all. No. So the possibility that anybody out there listening has even heard us yet—it's—it uh, it hasn't even happened. So, yeah, it's it, twenty-nine more wrong. years. Yeah. 29 more years for the first habitable planet of maybe intersecting our radio waves, if I'm understanding how their data works. Yeah. All right. It's crazy. It's it's just it's just crazy out there for just so much and how much is out there for that. And we can hope that one of these days we're actually going to uh, find something out there. I'm not so certain this uh, UFO paper is going to show us anything, though. I'm uh, just not buying it. Just not buying it. <laughs> um, there was another article out there today or uh, earlier this week that I wanted to talk about for super apps. And uh, the reason I wanted to bring this one up, how many of the super apps are you familiar with there, Bill? Um, actually, I'm not familiar with any of those in particular. I'm going to scroll all the way down here towards the bottom. This is a really nice article talking about why they're uh, building this in West Africa and how they're building and doing these things. But I want to point out um, WeChat, which is, is the number one super app right now. And to give a better definition, a super app is something where you have multiple um, applications wrapped up into one. So Gozum, which is the one that this article talks about, which is just broken into the top list here, it combines chat with uh, ride sharing, with banking, 
with all sorts of different stuff, shopping, et cetera, all combined into one package. So you never leave the app. The app can control how much data you use. So in a place like Africa where data is much more expensive, it's fast and easy to access something and stay in the same app and not have to worry about downloading something else or doing all these other things. Um, WeChat is the most popular one in the world. Um, and they have 1.2 billion monthly users right now. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, just think, I mean, even if you had 100% market penetration in the United States, you're still talking only 340, 360 million people. Right. And, and WeChat's got a, over a billion and they're not even taking over all of China yet. Well, it's easy to see why they would reach such popularity because, of course, everyone likes convenience. And when you yeah. can do multiple functions from one place without having to get it through different apps, and then also you're minimizing your, your risk of security, it's just uh, it's a no-brainer to want to use a, uh, an app like that. Yeah, and it yeah. makes it so much easier, especially if you're not running a super high-end top smartphone if you you can run these things on a much lower um scale phone because these apps take up less space and you don't have to have six different apps you can just have the one app and have it running and going um the other thing uh go to just made a big announcement earlier this year where they combined uh two different um apps gojek and yep. Uh, tokopedia which are two big ones in indonesia there was a lot of speculation uh when in the previous, in the previous US administration when they were banning the Chinese apps, whether those apps would be things that might actually take their place. But turns out that they still have not been able to unseat anyone yet. Though 100 million people is nothing to sneeze at, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> and those are staggering numbers without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. it's just crazy. But the one story that I found this week that really caught my attention, and I really just loved this thing was somebody did and i've got the entire paper when we put put the links up on the show notes for you guys we'll put a link to the original paper because that's what we always do um they did a lot of research on how lighting sources in for neanderthals and in you know prehistoric times for what they used and how they did things and far too often we just kind of I think to say, oh, well, they didn't have technology. They didn't have these sorts of things. And so how good could they have been or what could they have done? And just going in and finding and showing exactly how much light they could use. Um, like the picture shows here, all you need is a regular campfire and you can light up this cave quite a bit. And using just natural stuff, doing those things. And here is the one that really uh, struck me was in this picture here, you can see where the person is standing down on the cave floor. And if they were holding their normal torch or light or lamp or whatever, they wouldn't be able to see all the art that was done up top. But then someone comes up here and builds on the fireplace. And now all of a sudden, you can see all the art. It's just so fun and cool. And one thing that this article reminded me of was uh, Monet's uh, haystacks, because he painted um, like 30 of them, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And each one was painted with a different lighting because it was at a different time of day. And his whole focus was on how uh, different lighting affected the way that the haystacks looked and how you perceive them. And I thought it was yeah. very interesting. That and the idea that some of these look like some of these paintings, once they started doing these tests, they didn't prove, but they kind of s helped substantiate some of the um, previous ideas that some of these paintings were meant to be seen by firelight because as the flames flicker, it makes the animals and scenes seem like they're moving or seem like they're coming alive. Yeah, that was interesting. And, and that's it's, such it's, a, an unusual um, uh, idea for somebody from that time to actually 
create yeah. something yeah. in the thinking that they also wanted to have movement as well as uh, portraying what it is. Yeah, it's it was just it's a it's a really great article. It gets really in depth. Um, we would never we could do one whole episode just on this story. Um, it, but it it bring to mind. Um, and by the way, here is the actual story out there, the actual article out here, for you to go read that was published uh, just earlier in June. And it uh, they did a whole lot of research on different types of oil and different types of plants and all sorts of how you build a torch and how you would hold stuff and what kind of wood you could use that was native to the area and everything like that. So it gets really in, in depth on it if you want to go out there. Or if you're like me and I'm into my Dungeons and Dragons game and I'm like, see, this is exactly what I need. <laughs> <laughs> this is what people were really looking and doing with. Um, and that's my cool uh library bit here to, to help wrap up for the day is a, a book that I really like that fit right into this theme. It just immediately hit my mind when I read this article. It's called A World Lit Only by Fire, William Gibson, William Manchester, sorry. And uh, Manchester really does a good job of giving you um, a story, the final big story when the world didn't have electricity. Um, this is published back in the early 90s, and it's all about uh, Magellan's uh, voyage around the world. Because when he <laughs> finished and he came back, it just so happened that they were starting to electrify things. And so if you want something interesting, you would just want to, th to take a look at the world out there in a totally different <laughs> mode and a totally different idea. Go for it and go come out and check this and read uh, a world that only by fire. It, it's a really great, easy read for you, not complicated at all. And uh, I've I found it a lot of fun. I've I've had it on my shelf now for a couple. Wow, I guess for a couple of decades now, huh? That's that's pretty much. Um, and it is summer, so I need to show you guys. Come on in for summer learning, uh, Broward.org slash library slash summer. Come register, come take the classes, come read a book, listen to a book. Uh, just like I showed you there for that World Lit Only by Fire. If you listen to it, if you download the MP3, if you go on Hoopla, all the possibilities right there. Take place, add it to your Beanstack, win prizes. We're giving away some really cool stuff this year. Um, it's been a lot of fun to do this summer thing for us. Thank you very much, Sir Bill, for being out here this week. What's going on out there at your place? Up at a well, one thing, point. Um, one thing that's interesting right now is we've uh, reorganized our friend's book area, and it, by doing so, it's getting a lot more attention. And uh, one thing I find interesting with donations is that I every now and then will look through them and something will strike me. And it just so happens... Um, at another library not long ago, I came across a donation of the book of the, uh, it was a biography about Che Rivera. It was about 800 pages. So it was a very in-depth study. Wow. And it wow. it uh, was based on all of his own writings and writings of other people that he was involved with. And it really gave an interesting look into the man whose intent was so different than what his initial outcome was. Because his mm -hmm. intention was so different from how everything transpired in it. Uh, you would never believe uh, how really honest and pure his intention was in the beginning and how it got so distorted as time went on. Yeah, and the yeah. systems just get, keep spinning around. Yep. Just craziness. And uh, for everybody out there, please you know, support your local friends groups if you stop by a book sale. And, and go in to help support the, the friends of the library are there to help support Broward County libraries and help us with our uh, events and everything else like that that goes on. So please, if you get the chance and you're stopping by your library, we've reopened all the library friend sales now and everybody's taking donations again finally. So we're, we're really getting back into our normal swing of things that we were in the in the before times. And as I keep saying, we're not going back to normal, we're going to better. So it's all going to be a great thing for us. 
Let me throw up our final slide here. Thank you again, Mr. Bill, for being here with us this week. Um, if anybody out there, you have your favorite library or your favorite librarian you want to come see on Tech Talk, remember creation station at Broward.org comes right to me. We'll try and feature them on there and we'll see you next week. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Bob.